Hello everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna talk more about our Taylor polynomials, which are the uh, partial sums of our Taylor series. We're also gonna talk about this important concept called the remainder of a Taylor polynomial, and we'll see how that can help us control the error in using a Taylor polynomial approximation. And we'll also see how it can uh, help us determine when a function actually converges to its Taylor series. And so let's quickly review what a Taylor polynomial is. So a Taylor polynomial of a function f of x is uh, denoted as tn of x, and it's gonna be the sum from i equals zero to n of the i derivative of our function evaluated at a, which is like the center of our Taylor polynomial or Taylor series. So that's starting to build our coefficient. We have the i derivative at a times the quantity x minus a to the power of i, and each term is divided by i factorial. So this really is just our uh, Taylor series for our function f of x, but just the partial sum of our Taylor series, the sum from uh, i equals zero to n, so those first n plus one terms. And so with that, we can talk about and define the idea of the remainder of the Taylor series or Taylor polynomial, and it's basically mimicking the idea we talked about earlier when we discussed remainders for a general series. All right, and so now we're ready to give our definition of what we mean by the remainder of a Taylor series. And so first, if our function f of x actually can be expressed as the sum of its Taylor series, then we can think of writing our function f of x as t sub n of x plus r sub n of x, where t sub n is just our nth degree Taylor polynomial. That's like the sum of from i equals zero to n of those first n plus one terms of our Taylor series. And r sub n of x is going to be our remainder, which is the sum of all the other terms, all the terms past n. So that'll be like the n plus first term, the n plus second term, and so on. And so our Taylor polynomial Tn of x is going to be a partial sum, a finite sum, and Rn is going to be an infinite sum that we call the remainder of the series. And so the idea of the remainder is basically the same as when we talked about it earlier for a general series. The remainder we can kind of think of as the uh, error in our uh, partial sum approximation for the series. And so that leads us into our next theorem, which we're not going to take the time to prove in this video, but hopefully it intuitively makes sense with the idea that the remainder is the error. And so this theorem says that if our function f of x is actually equal to its Taylor series, well, it's going to be equal to its Taylor series on that interval of convergence if and only if the limit as n approaches infinity of our remainder goes to zero. Or in other words, if we keep using our Taylor polynomial and let n go to infinity, or in other words, if we keep using our Taylor polynomial and take the limit as n goes to infinity of it, then the remainder of those Taylor polynomials or the errors are getting smaller and smaller and the error is going to zero. And so this concept of the remainder is our way of kind of gauging the error and using a Taylor polynomial approximation for a function or the value of a function. Um, but what this theorem and this earlier stuff we've talked about doesn't tell us how to do is actually how to evaluate the remainder. Right? The remainder itself is going to be an infinite series, and so if we want to know how much error there is in our approximation, we have to calculate this remainder, which means we have to find the sum of this other related infinite series. But we're not actually going to do that. Instead, we're going to use something like Taylor's inequality to help us out. So Taylor's inequality, as we can kind of see in its final statement here, is going to give us an inequality involving the remainder or the error in our approximation, and it's going to give us an upper bound for that error. And so Taylor's inequality is going to allow us to say that uh, given these set of circumstances, our error has to be less than this number. So if we make an approximation, we can plug our information into Taylor's inequality to get a uh, upper bound for the error in our approximation, or we can kind of reverse engineer it. If we want to have a certain amount of accuracy in our approximation, we can figure out uh, what value of n is needed to make this upper bound uh, small enough to guarantee that amount of accuracy. So what Taylor's inequality actually says is, if we can find a maximum for the absolute value of the n plus first derivative for our function on the interval described by the inequality, the absolute value of x minus a is less than or equal to d, then the remainder of our Taylor series or our Taylor polynomial is going to satisfy this inequality. The absolute value of the nth remainder is going to be less than or equal to this number n times the absolute value of x minus a to the power of n plus 1 all over n plus 1 factorial. So like I mentioned earlier, this uh, Taylor's inequality gives us a way of kind of creating an upper bound for our remainder or our error in using a Taylor polynomial. That's really helpful for when we're trying to make approximations, but can also be helpful for determining 
when a function converges to its Taylor series and what the interval of convergence of that function is going to be. All right, everyone, so let's go ahead and look at this example where we're going to see how Taylor's inequality can help us determine the interval of convergence of a Taylor series, or in this case, the Maclaurin series for our sine function. So in this example, we're going to show that the Maclaurin series for our sine function actually converges for all x values. So it has an infinite radius of convergence, and its interval of convergence is going to be all real numbers, the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity. And so the way we're going to do this is we're going to show that this function is going to be equal to its Taylor series no matter which x value we use. And we're going to do that by showing that no matter which x value we use, the remainder is always going to go to zero. And so to help us do that, we're going to use Taylor's inequality. And so the first thing we have to find in Taylor's inequality is this number m, which is representing like this maximum value of the absolute value of the n plus first derivative of the function we're creating this series for. And so the function we're creating this series for is our sine function. And so we have to kind of start by thinking of what is the n plus first derivative of our sine function going to look like? Well, that depends on what n actually is. But if we think about the possible derivatives of our sine function, we can recognize that they start to loop and repeat themselves, right? The first derivative of sine is cosine of x. The second derivative of sine of x is going to be negative sine of x. The third derivative of sine of x is going to be negative cosine of x. And then the fourth derivative of sine of x is going to be uh, sine of x again. And after that, we just start to go through a loop and repeat those functions and those derivatives over and over. So we can see that the n plus first derivative of our sine function is either going to be plus or minus cosine of x or plus or minus sine of x. And so what's really nice about this is no matter which of these four options we end up encountering, we can see that the n plus first derivative is always going to be bounded above by the number one, right? If we think about plus or minus our cosine function or plus or minus our sine function, they're all going to be in the range from negative one to positive one. So they're always strictly less than positive one. And so with that little bit of analysis, we know that the n plus first derivative of our function here is always going to be less than or equal to 1. So when we use Taylor's inequality, we're going to be able to use it by setting uh, m equal to 1. And so next, we have to think about the rest of Taylor's inequality. And so what we have so far is that the nth remainder, rn of x, has to be less than or equal to this number m, which we just argued has to be 1, multiplied by the absolute value of x minus a to the power of n plus 1. But our a value is just the center of our series, and we're working with a Maclaurin series, so a is equal to 0. So our numerator simplifies to just the absolute value of x to the power of n plus 1, and that is going to be over n plus 1 factorial. And so remember, we're trying to make the argument here that this remainder is going to go to 0 no matter which x value we pick. That way, the Maclaurin series for our sine function will converge for all x values. So this has to go to 0 no matter which x value we pick. And we're actually able to make that claim directly. We can argue that this thing has to always go to 0. And so there's quite a few ways to make this argument. You could do something straightforward like a ratio test or something like that. But uh, there's another way that I think is pretty clever. And that's to remember our series for our natural exponential function e to the x. So earlier we talked about how we can express e to the x as a Maclaurin series that converges for all x values. The Maclaurin series for e to the x was the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. And well, we know that this series converges for all x values. And since it converges for all x values, it's going to be a convergent series for all x values. But one of our earlier divergence tests for series was the only way a series can converge is if the terms in that series go to 0. Well, what do the terms in our series look like? They look like x to the power of n over n factorial, which is just a re-indexing or shifting of the absolute value of x to the n plus 1 over a n plus 1 factorial. And so with that, we know that this quantity, the absolute value of x to the power of n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial, has to go to 0 for all x values. 
And since the remainder goes to zero for all x values, all x values are going to be in the interval of convergence for this Taylor series. Hello everyone, welcome back. I have another example I want us to look at together where we see how we can apply Taylor's inequality. And so in this example, we're going to approximate the value of sine of pi over 15 using a fifth degree Taylor polynomial. And then we're going to determine how accurate is our approximation. And so to get started, we're going to need to construct this fifth degree Taylor polynomial for our sine function. And we're going to do that by using our Maclaurin series for our sine function. So remember, sine of x, we could express as the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of negative 1 to the power of n times x to the power of 2n plus 1 all over 2n plus 1 factorial. All right, so if we're going to approximate sine of pi over 15 using a fifth degree Taylor polynomial, we don't need our entire infinite series here. We just need the first few terms until we get up to that fifth power of x showing up. And so let's go ahead and generate all the terms we really need in our approximation for our sine function using this Maclaurin series. So we'll start by plugging in n equals 0. And well, if we plug in n equals 0, we just get x. If we plug in uh, n equals 1, we're going to get negative x cubed over 3 factorial. If we plug in x equals 2, we're going to get positive um, x to the fifth over 5 factorial. And so using that nice formula we cooked up earlier, we can very quickly generate the terms in our series needed to create this Taylor polynomial. Our fifth degree Taylor polynomial is just x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the fifth over 5 factorial. And now if we want to use this Taylor polynomial to approximate the value of sine of pi over 15, well, we just have to plug in x equals pi over 15, so that'll give us pi over 15 minus pi over 15 cubed divided by 3 factorial is the same as multiplied by 1 over 6. And then we have to add to this pi over 15 to the power of 5 divided by 1 over 5 factorial or multiplied by 1 over 120. And so this is the value we get out of our fifth degree Taylor polynomial approximation to our sine function. And we'll finish this example off. We now need to answer the question, how accurate is our approximation? And for that, we're going to use Taylor's inequality and create this upper bound for the remainder of our approximation or the remainder of our Taylor polynomial. And so remember, Taylor's inequality tells us that we can compute this upper bound for the error or our remainder by first computing this maximum value of the n plus first derivative of our function. And so remember, when we're talking about creating this upper bound or error for our remainder here, we have to have the right value of n to plug in in the factorial and for the exponent of the absolute value of x minus a, as well as for finding the derivatives here to find m. However, in this example, we can actually be a little bit clever and create an even better uh, upper bound for the error than we might think. Because initially, just looking at everything that's presented on the board, well, it looks like we used n equals 5 and created a fifth degree Taylor polynomial for our sine function. But if we think about it, this is actually the same as the sixth degree Taylor polynomial approximation to our sine function. Right? Our sine function only includes these odd powers of x, all the even powers of x, uh, have a coefficient of zero. So if we wanted to, we could actually write and use the six degree uh, Taylor polynomial approximation to our sine function. That extra term that we'd add on would just be zero times x to the sixth. So because of this, we can actually look at an upper bound, not for r of five, but for r of six. And doing this in this case will actually give us a smaller number for our upper bound than if we would have used r of 5. And that means we'll have a better idea of the amount of error instead of an, like an overestimate of our error. All right, and so with that out of the way, we're looking for an upper bound for the absolute value of r sub 6 here. And so we're still going to have to start by calculating this number m, which is going to be the maximum of the absolute value of the n plus first derivative. So in that case, we're looking at the seventh derivative of our uh, sine function to create this maximum value m. But if we think about our sine function, its derivatives, 
There's one of our trig functions, sine or cosine, maybe multiplied by positive one or negative one. And all of those functions, plus or minus cosine or plus or minus sine, are all bounded above or have a maximum value of positive one. So with that argument, we can see that m is going to have to be equal to one when we set up this inequality in Taylor's inequality. All right, so the next piece we have to multiply that m number by in the numerator is the absolute value of x minus a to the power of n plus one. Well, a is the center of our uh, polynomial approximation or our series. And well, we're using a Maclaurin series for our sine function. So it's centered at zero and a is going to be equal to zero. So x is just the number we plug into our Taylor series or Taylor polynomial to make this approximation. And that was pi over 15. So technically, this is going to be the absolute value of pi over 15 minus zero. That's just pi over 15. And that's going to be raised to the power of, well, six plus one is seven. And this is part of the benefit we get from using uh, that observation earlier, where we can do this for r6 instead of r5. By raising this to the power of seven instead of the power of six, it's going to make it an even smaller number. And that means we'll have a smaller upper bound for our error. And the same thing is going to happen with this factorial in the denominator. So now it's going to be all over um, 6 plus 1 factorial or 7 factorial. If we had been doing this for r sub 5 instead, not kind of noticing that zero term that snuck in there, well, then this would be over 6 factorial, which compared to being over 7 factorial is going to be larger. So again, this is making that upper bound for our error even smaller than what we might have initially thought it was going to be. And so if we plug this expression into a calculator, uh, pi over 15 to the power of 7 divided by 7 factorial is going to be a super small number. It's about 3.5 times 10 to the power of negative 9. And so that means basically all these digits we see here are accurate. So that means our approximation is a, a pretty good approximation for sine of pi over 15. Another variation of this problem that wouldn't be too hard to do from this point is to figure out, well, what value of n do we need for a certain amount of accuracy? Like, say we need to be accurate to like 10 to the negative 10 or 10 to the negative 12 instead. What we do is we'd set up this inequality to be less than that number we need our accuracy to be less to, and then plug in values of n until the left-hand side of our inequality actually becomes less than that number. Sometimes we can solve those little inequalities uh, algebraically and find the number of n and round up. But oftentimes when it involves a function like the factorial function, it's really hard or impossible to solve it algebraically. So you just have to plug in n values and test until you figure out which n value works.